Hi, my name is Steve Nichols from Adelaide, Australia, and I'm here at London for the European Society of Cardiology meeting in 2015. We've also had the third PCSK9 forum, and it really has given a great opportunity again to meet with colleagues in the field uh, and to talk about the emerging science of PCSK9. Not only what we've learnt in terms of the biology of PCSK9, but now really we get to the heart of the matter in terms of how we're going to start to use these therapies in clinical practice. And you know, as we walk through the halls of the ESC this year, uh, there's a lot of buzz about PCSK9. We've had recent approvals for the inhibitors, both in the US and Europe. Uh, so we know that these agents are coming soon to clinical practice, and so there's a lot of excitement about that. We know that there are ongoing clinical trials and there's a lot of optimism about what they will show us in the next few years. And then at the same time, there also seems to be uh, an increase in enthusiasm around CTP inhibitors. This is a class of drugs which in their own right had a lot of excitement a, bit, a little bit more than a decade ago had uh, a number of stumbles along the way with torcetrapib and dalcetrapib, but now with the more potent CTP inhibitors moving forward in clinical development, the recent announcement that evacetrapib passed its futility assessment in its large clinical trial, and the thought that we're going to have the outcome results for those trials reported out in the next couple of years in parallel with PCSK9, we suddenly have this uh, great variety of therapies which the clinician may very well have um, at their, at, you know, be able to use in clinical practice uh, for their patients. And so the next really big question is going to be, if all of these agents work, how are we going to use them? Which, how are we going to decide which patient we're going to use, which agent we're going to use, and, and what's ultimately going to be the most important target? And I think that's really going to be where the field will then move into. I think it will be important when we first look at the results of the outcome trials to understand not only um, if these uh, therapies reduce cardiovascular events, which is the most important observation that they'll bring, but then to try and take a deeper dive to understand are there particular patients who are more likely to benefit? Can we individually phenotype a patient and then how can we then take that into the clinic in terms of trying to work out which patient should be treated with which agent and I, and I think that will open up a whole new field. I think we'll learn a lot from the factors that we can look at in the context of the current trials that are ongoing but then it will continue to raise the question can we develop more effective markers of risk that show us how high an individual's risk is, but ask the question, how modifiable is it, and what is it most likely going to be modified by? Is it going to be most modified by lowering LDL, raising HDL, some other intervention? And I think that will be important. To what degree that's new blood markers, whether it's imaging, and I think that there's a lot of activity in that space. Um, I think that will, has the potential to kind of tell us a lot. So there is a huge amount of excitement. I think the next couple of years is really where we're going to start to see the real results of these trials and hopefully we go to a point where we're starting to have positive findings of outcome trials reported at these meetings because we seem to see a lot of negative trials uh, when we come to these meetings. And then will come the really important question, how do we use these agents in clinical practice and what we can do and what questions we can ask to uh, help us really guide therapy.